thanks to all the panelists. Those are great introductions. And uh, not surprisingly, we already have questions popping up in the Google Doc. Uh, Nicholas, have you been tracking those? Do you want to kick off with a couple of those? Sure, sure. Um, we have a lot of good questions that, that are coming in. Um, a few things to maybe think about for everyone as we have this discussion on, on from both the panelists and from the audience is, is what are the things you know for the materials community that really resonate with this community, the needs of the community maybe that are a little different than others. Um, so it's something to, to, to think about. Um, so one of the questions we had um, starting at the top from, from Benjamin Kaufold um, is about open access journals and kind of perceptions in terms of moving from uh, paid publications to open access. Um, and how do people feel about about this in terms of, uh, you know, predatory journals that have often said they were open access and kind of getting beyond the perceptions of, 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 of the validity of science and, and open access data. So I don't know if anyone from the panel wants to jump in on this. So I mean, I guess maybe one comment I'll make to this, to the question is that a lot of uh, journals and publications are moving to open access data. Um, so I think that, you know, that's, we're kind of getting beyond the perception um, in the sense that, that these journals aren't as high impact as others. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, David or Kate on the, uh, uh, from the uh, organizers want to chime in on this one. I guess I, I can jump in and say that there are different levels of open access, and I think we're all interested to see what's happening to the publishing model in light of the uh, equitable access guidelines, and we're a long way from knowing that. But certainly, uh, we've made a lot of strides already in open access to the data that supports publications, and what we have heard in other MARTA discussions, starting with the very inception of MARTA, is that the journals don't want to be in the business of also being data repositories at this point in time. And so um, that we have an opportunity here to uh, connect and make sure that our repositories are um, in some sense certified, uh, sustainable, and other things <clears throat> that make them suited for uh, really fair access. Those are things that have been discussed in working groups. Actually, on Thursday, there's a going to be a short working group uh, report about um, uh, perspective piece that's come out of MARTA on fair access and material or fair for materials specifically. And uh, there are some thoughts in there about repositories. And in our session on repositories, um, it'll be discussed. But certainly, it kind of gets back also to this main issue of sustainability, whether it's um, the science or the repositories themselves, which was a question that um, I was wondering about, uh, that maybe the panelists have some feeling about that to do this, we also have to uh, engage that issue of sustainability that many of us think about and is often um, difficult to come up with. Um, so I'm not sure if um, any of the panelists have thoughts on that. I just had something else that I was going to add about um, open access journals and, and connection to uh, open data associated therewith. And I think it's like, what strikes me and I hear uh, colleagues also talk about is that the, the most of the open access journals require significant publication fees because the um, because the, the the data the papers are all open but they're not since they don't want to get in the business of running repositories then we're then we're paying to have the paper open but not to have the data put someplace uh, in a repository associated with it so in some ways it would be nice if that could be coupled and I don't know if there are any I, I don't know if there are any models that are looking that are looking at that like right now with partnerships between journals and repositories so Kate David uh, you know maybe I'll, I'll just add a little bit I I think one of the things that I sometimes struggle with and I got to keep reminding myself when we talk about these things um, is that there's a, a hierarchy of data and information to knowledge. Uh, and there's also a, a, a spectrum of use of that data. Um, and maybe different models are necessary at different parts along the way. I mean, I always have looked at um, peer reviewed journals as a consumer of that. It's a consumer of information and knowledge. And the uh, journal sort of 
provides a brand of quality. If I could put that in quotes, it ran a quality check. It's not just something that came off of a machine. Um, and I think that's what the publishing business model is really structured around. Um, you know, data repositories and data um, uh, sources uh, is another totally different business model um, that, you know, if, if it's free and open, there still has to be resources coming from somewhere. And so sort of my comments on a business model, what is that business model? Um, is it philanthropy? Uh, is it government? Or does it have to have some sort of hierarchy uh, on using that data for maybe more proprietary knowledge um, discovery, uh, but the core of the data is open? So that someone uses the data, but has the algorithms to be almost a consultant to ask, uh, to answer others' questions for fees, but the data is also open uh, and sustained through those models. I think at the end of the day, that spectrum space of use of the data versus the refinement of the data um, is, a, is, is an exciting area for new entrepreneurs and businesses to evolve and the needs of a materials community versus the needs of a of astronomy or ag are all going to be different. Um, and so I think it's an exciting opportunity to start getting VCs and entrepreneurs and business schools involved in trying to answer some of these questions because the classic models and the business approaches aren't sustainable. Over. Great point, Rich, thank you. Uh, and if I may build a bit on what uh, Rich said, uh, one other notable aspect of the 2022 memo is that it isn't looking for just the uh, research data to validate a scientific publication, but validate and replicate. Um, so I think uh, the DOE already considers, say, code that's developed as one of the research products that can be supported and shared openly, and we can assign it a persistent identifier if it comes out of our research. Uh, so the concept of noting the data's worth, sharing it openly, but also the tools that help process the data that enable replication and maybe enable that being a stepping stone to the next result or the next use of that knowledge that was generated could be very helpful. Uh, so it might help spur an ecosystem that uh, better enables that replication of finding and better enables uh, people to take the next step in an effort uh, more rapidly than they might have been able to before. And I think the underlying key to that is those persistent identifiers that can connect all the pieces. Uh, and an important uh, parallel element is giving people the recognition for what they've shared and contributed to the community for the data and the code and these other pieces of a scientific workflow, not just the publication about that result. So, Mike, if I could just add something real quick on that. Uh, excellent points. Agree completely. Um, also, I think it emphasizes the diversity of the community that needs to be involved and adapt. Uh, many of us in the materials community use uh, equipment that is purchased from equipment suppliers. Um, a lot of the data for replication is embedded in proprietary code, software, et cetera, in that equipment and from the equipment manufacturers. And so standards throughout the whole community that allows when I buy an FTIR, I buy a spectrometer, I buy a characterization tool set, the metadata and the environmental data that exists in that equipment so they know as a supplier it meets specs but you never can access and it never spits out as a user. Those are the types of things that if it becomes automated uh, and part of the broader data flow, it enhances all of our ability to not just replicate, but most importantly, understand why it's not replicatable and what was the unknowns in experiment A that we may not be paying attention to, but we need to. So there's a lot in the, in the uh, equipment manufacturers, I think, and, and, and those who supply us the tools, software or hardware, uh, that, that need to be involved in the discussion. Yeah, those are great points, Rich. I mean, there's a very active working group, shout out to uh, Matthew and Peter who are here and we'll have a, a report out on the working group on Thursday on automated metadata extractors, which 
for instruments that do put things out in the headers of their files, people all over the world are working on that. And so there's a working group on trying to get a standardized layer and API to make that and a register a registry of those tools. We've made a lot of progress um, actually on that front, but really getting the manufacturers to buy in as much as possible and where's the leverage. I know Alex has, has spoken eloquently about the needs for sociological sort of culture change in the way people think about um, sharing data and the like. Certainly uh, the instrument makers also need to be part of that. Um, and have a business model that works for them that opens things up so uh, david if i can jump in uh, and Please. motivated by what michael and rich were saying it occurred to me that uh, at some point the uh, the the process of peer review uh, should be uh, somewhat re-examined uh, re and uh, augmented to uh, include uh, the steps of data uh, validation and also consideration of uh, considerations of replication and this is where the uh, I think the community should uh, take uh, uh, initiative in recognizing this as uh, something that needs to happen and also perhaps defining the parameters within you know, this is a reasonable thing to do yeah I'm gonna jump in here real quick and try to talk. So sorry if my voice is low. Um, you know, I, I agree with what a lot of the speakers have said. With NASA, we're asking as of 2023, we now ask that all publications uh, are without embargo, open access immediately. But we also, at the time of publication, are asking that all data and software are shared with that publication. And we're not attaching that data or that software necessarily to the, uh, the journal. So we're asking for you to have a data, an open source science plan, a data management plan and a software management plan that include how, you know, what parts of your data need to be open and accessible that you anticipate publishing, how long they may need to be accessible. You know, not all data needs to be saved forever. So plan and budget for that process so that when you get to the publication point, you're not all of a sudden searching for a repository and trying to figure out your metadata. And I, I think that this then goes to what Alex just said, which is, you know, we are sort of in a, a peer review almost crisis right now where information and publications are being produced at a pace that we can't keep track of. And many, many of them are not replicatable. Uh, or even reproducible and including the data and software is a step towards that. But we also need to start thinking about how peer review may need to change to include both the data and the software so that, you know, if our goal is to advance science, we really need to make sure that those incentives are in place, that that sharing is happening so that we are really advancing science. When we do our publication, people are able to reproduce it. And they're able to do so, you know, somewhat easily. It'll there always be some barriers, especially with larger data sets. But you know, at that point, you could decide to put your data on the cl a cloud server, on an S3 bucket, and allow people to just run their analysis adjacent to it. And you could plan for that in your open data plan. So, kind of uh, following up a little bit on this, uh, there's a couple other questions related to this. Um, as we talk about open data plans, and you mentioned putting, putting data, let's say, in the cloud, do the agencies foresee having um, either tools or recommended repositories for data? Or they, do they intend on leaving this entirely up to the PI to figure that out um, with potentially augmented funding? And I know maybe the DOE has some things. There's DOE code, uh, at least for, for software and, and OSTI does have a little bit in terms of persistent identifiers and minting DOI. Um, but I was wondering how these agent, how the agencies uh, view this going forward. Is it something that they intend on supporting um, in the standardized way or that they're just gonna leave up to the, uh, the PIs to handle? Uh, so I'll chime in with the DOE perspective at least. Uh, so first I'll note that the new OSTP memo also calls out the NSTC's guidance that was also issued earlier last year, um, desirable characteristics for data repositories that are federally funded. 
Uh, so these are guidelines. There's not a formal group to go to for a seal, but the new memo asks that those be considered when people are selecting um, their repositories. Uh, so that's in the memo guidance to the agencies. Um, so clearly I don't have an update from the DOE because our plan is not out yet, but I wanted to at least highlight that the memo uh, had that embedded in it. Uh, considering our current guidance for data management plans, um, we don't specify uh, specific repositories in a general sense, but the plan comes in as part of a proposal and is reviewed and held to the best practices within the community. So we do get peer review feedback on data management plans and that community consensus, the best practices in the community can factor into all of the aspects, including the selected repository. But with that said, specific solicitations or funding opportunities sometimes do require very specific data repositories to be used. Uh, and those are ones we support, for instance, uh, the atmospheric radiation um, measurement uh, user facility, uh, data that's related to solicitations for ARM will go into the um, ARM data center and then be available through it. And then OSTI is a central place that you can go to within the DOE to find all of the data sets that have been uh, reported back to us uh, through their digital object identifiers. So we don't host the data directly, um, at least from the federal side. It might be found in our laboratories or in some of the repositories we support, but we do give a central place for you to find all of those um, with the DOIs that let you get to them and access them. Uh, and that's part of what we highlight with our pure data resources designations that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so there's a mixture of a few approaches um, and we do hold the data resources that we support to very high standards and look for things like DOI usage and whether they're really supporting the community and advancing our mission in the best practices for that community. And I can jump in to add that we also uh, support the development of many data repositories and uh, our approach has been that in an ideally crafted data management plan, we expect the PI to tell us, I'm going to use this uh, data repository for this specific reason. And uh, as long as, as that happens. Yeah, and this is Rich. Rich, I'll just uh, add, um, so this is Rich's opinion. It's not the official Department of the Air Force's opinion. Um, we will leave it up to uh, the proposer to put the right data in the right place for the right use. I think that's consistent with what everybody else has has commented. And that's kind of what I meant by one of the challenges up front is there will be federated data. Uh, how do you converge? Because the knowledge will come from the convergence of these uh, repositories, not just from one. So the identifier or what is used is I think gonna be a critical standard, I guess, for the community. Uh, as to funding, um, I do not foresee, uh, and this is again, Rich's opinion from the Department of the Defense Department of the Air Force, additional resources going into supporting this mandate. So if it's gonna cost additional resources for sustainment, putting things in the cloud, you know, costs money. Um, how long will it be there, et cetera? Uh, those are all gonna cost money to keep it. Uh, data storage is not free, uh, nor is the sustainment or the access of it. That's gonna have to come from uh, the current uh, appropriations that are set aside for science. Over. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, uh, John Allison, do you want to uh, ask your question or would you like uh, one of us to ask it regarding incentives for data sharing? Uh, sure, I'm happy to answer. I've asked the question. I've got it up here on uh, Google Sheets, which I just managed to lose. Um, yeah, um, so um, I think Shayla just mentioned incentives uh, for data sharing. And um, I think that's a really important. Uh, there's sort of a chicken and egg incentive slash mandates and, and sustainable repositories. Or, we don't know which to uh, is going to happen first. But at any rate, uh, I'm just wondering what sort of incentives the agencies uh, uh, individually are thinking about for data sharing. And, and in particular, would you find recommendations on incentives uh, 
from MARTA useful if we had a working group on that? We've been at NASA uh, thinking a lot about the incentives for open science as well as uh, for sharing data. Uh, and we'd be happy to hear from this community more about what they would like to see as incentives, but we have been thinking in three different ways. And the first is um, funding, that if you want NASA funding, your data is required to be open. So if you want money for your science, we feel like that's a pretty big incentive. Uh, but the next is uh, developing awards around open science activities, including open data and partnering with both societies and, and other agencies to develop these awards that really can help recognize career achievements. So not just sharing your data because you have to, but people who've really gone and shared data to advance science and done so in a way that advances science. Uh, so looking at creating more of these awards that really help people advance their careers. And then second uh, working or third, working with universities, uh, because as a federal agency, we can't really tell people what to do. We can just provide uh, funding for research that we're interested in, but we can, also, you know, work with universities and talk to them because there are a number of them that are already engaged in updating their review, promotion, and tenure activities and how they're doing those evaluations to include open science activities and to recognize the sharing of data and software and open access publications and other types of community efforts to advance science as part of their career promotion packages. Thanks, Joe. So there, yeah, there thank you. I, I wonder if I could just chime in since I'm still yeah. unmuted. Uh, uh, if uh, DOE and NSF and the Air Force have similar thoughts or different thoughts or. Uh, so happy to chime in. Um, our current policy, of course, is the data management plans are supposed to describe how data would be shared. Um, that has been in place since our 2014 plan. Uh, and so at least as far as our research funding is concerned, that's a big incentive. Uh, but especially through the way we help issue digital object identifiers for publicly available data that's reported back to us, uh, we do want to be able to connect the dots between all of the elements of research ecosystem that we support. Uh, we definitely recognize that developing the code, the process, a very large data set is in and of itself uh, a worthwhile research endeavor. That's why we support the open sharing of code and also offer digital object identifiers for it through our DOE code system. And we'd like to make sure we connect the dots to show that uh, publicly available data also had an impact on the research output. So we'd certainly like to be able to connect all those pieces. And uh, as Shell said, an important element um, that we don't have control over is the career recognition that all of these are important contributions uh, beyond just the publications that might be considered more traditionally for uh, tenure decisions or career advancement. Uh, so we do think it's important. We think that's aligned with the vision of uh, the previous OSTP memo, the new OSTP memo, and we're trying to provide the tools to support all of that as part of a larger ecosystem. Uh, and also by highlighting how important data is in our mission space by designating our pure data resources, these uh, publicly available, uh, reusable research data sets that are held to very high standards and we think advance our mission and benefit the community. Uh, so we would certainly like to know uh, how we can ensure that we're aligned with the community and understand the incentive structures uh, that work with all of you because we do think it's very important and certainly think uh, that recognition is an important element of that. Uh, thanks, and, Michael. I, and to, to gonna... add, I think uh, just one small comment that uh, we do need, I think, a robust mechanism that uh, and the wide uh, understanding from the community that this uh, of the obligation for proper referencing same way that uh, it's done for uh, regular publication, I think the same should be done for uh, 
a data set that is uh, shared. Uh, this is Rich. I, I don't really have anything additional to add um, other than I think this emphasizes that our community has a cultural shift it has to go through. Um, other disciplines embrace data, embrace open data to varying degrees, uh, whether it's biology, astronomy, uh, and I think materials, a lot of these things we've talking about fundamentally boils down to a culture shift, whether it is recognition of the individual, valuing the data, uh, valuing the dialogue as much as the paper. And so I think we have we have a challenge that is a long-term challenge to achieve a lot of the goals we've been talking about over. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rich. I, I, I think one thing that um, we have a tendency in these discussions to hear a lot from academic researchers, but of course in the materials world, we're all interested in making something in the end, right? And having our, our work go out and um, be used and maybe uh, be in production somewhere. And so we have this range of issues with opening data um, that go from perhaps classified data, data with security issues, sensitive data of one type or another, or intellectual property. Um, and so uh, we end up sort of having both those issues of wanting to be very open to drive science ahead, but needing to also have an ability to work with the same types of tools in a subtler way. And um, certainly the agencies represented here today have missions that span a large portion of that spectrum. Um, I wonder if there's room for us to develop uh, ways to move forward and embrace all aspects of the community when thinking about these, and if people have thoughts on that. Uh, well, so David, I'll start since I'm on the extreme. Um, Please go ahead. I, I think I absolutely agree. And I think it's the power of that ability to move the information up and down both ways. The challenges with which industry faces and being able to bring back down to the scientific community the need for specific types of data, uh, as well as for the scientific community to be open to innovate, to create new markets and new opportunities. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that it is a unique challenge to many more applied engineering uh, disciplines of how you run that bar. But I think if we do it right, that's where the the large payoff to future technologies and, and the solution of many of our societal problems will lie in, not just discovering new science, but figuring out how we discover the new science, bring it up to proprietary, classified, whatever you wanna call it, but more controlled environments, and then funneling back down where those holes are and creating that partnership. And if it's all around data and how data is shared, I think that's a foundational concept. Over. Uh, and as an agency that uh, supports fundamental science, but also has important partnerships with industry through programs like ARPA-E, um, EERE as well. Uh, and of course, we've got national security with the NNSA. Um, there's a, a very wide variety of the kinds of data that might be involved in the R&D efforts and other projects that we support. So we're very mindful of the fact that the new OSTP memo aims to maximize appropriate sharing of data involved in research, uh, and that appropriate is a, a highly loaded word that includes that considerations can limit data sharing based on things like uh, business proprietary information based on U.S. competitiveness, based on national security, and based on intellectual property, uh, and a number of other factors. Uh, so these are very important pieces of the vision shared in the OSTP memo. Our current public access plan already has some of those exceptions in place. Um, and so depending on uh, the exact nature of the research being supported, um, those limitations can come into effect and may be very important. Uh, and it's also very clear that the memo applies to uh, unclassified or otherwise unrestricted data as well. Uh, so those caveats are certainly very important to consider. Uh, and I think I wanna just echo Rich's vision that we wanna enable those connections so that the basic fundamental science can go and have broader impact uh, and we work very hard to make sure that new ideas, new technology can transition into industry as well. So all those factors are part of it. 
Uh, and that's another area where, of course, engagement with the community to understand the subtleties of those connections can be very important. Great points. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, so another another kind of theme that's come up in some of these questions, um, going back to the software perspective, um, you know, a lot of the data analysis that's done in data processing is actually quite complex. So on one end, there's the artifact of a data set, uh, there's an artifact of a piece of software, but then there's the the workflow, as it were, the providence of what you've done with that, that actually gets you from the data maybe collected at an experiment to scientific output. Um, is there thought in terms of the, these data management plans and, and guidance from the agencies about how to capture and collect and add reproducibility in that space? Tough question. So, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, I would say when when we talk internally the difference between data and information i think we think of information as the application of the workflows to the data using software etc to extract things and the reproducibility is all those combined um to be honest it's only been recently we've been starting to think about how do we document the workflows um there's tools that are being developed uh by a variety of companies that, um, as well as in academia, uh, that we've been starting to look at. Um, it's key to, if you wanna automate or uh, start doing things in a high throughput manner, the workflow and the workflow planners are just as important as your data plan and your software. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are all important things that I guess ultimately sh should be uh, documented, part of that underlying uh method section let's say uh that how they all come together is 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 then the key uh key part to to driving the results um we don't have any policies on it we're just trying to figure out what's available right now and how to think about documenting those types of things over yeah i mean some communities if you look at like lhc or the high energy physics community have decades of experience doing this, but these are very domain specific tools and, and workflows. Um, the materials community is maybe just beginning to do this, um, but maybe challenge um, this soon to try to do, do something in a standardized way, but it's still very critical if we want to reach the spirit of the document, right? Which is reproducible science and, and openness. Um, I'm sorry, Michael, were you going to uh, jump in? Uh, well, I think you raise a very interesting point. We need to understand where the scientific domains, where each community is at with respect to this, and maybe what's important within that domain to share. Uh, for, with a Large Hadron Collider as an example, there's um, many layers of processing of the data. It is not clear that the raw data directly from the experiment is the best or most efficient way to share that uh, externally for any sort of reproducibility. Um, the idea would be to balance the cost and administration um, of the data management burden versus the value it brings to the community at large. So there's likely some layer of the workflow that's more appropriate and balances well that need to validate and replicate findings um, versus the burden that it would be to share uh, that much data and the tools that support its workflow. Um, but there's many scientific domains supported across the Office of Science, and I think the answer can be different within each of those. So once again, I think uh, the community uh, would be the source for understanding what is the best way to try to share. Are there the right standards in place for that sharing? Um, is there a way to pull the data pieces together um, and make them easier to access, make them more interoperable? And those are the sorts of things that can maybe help the next generation of open science results that are based on pulling together data from many different sources. So I think this will be a very interesting place to engage with each scientific community uh, because we will need to understand what is the right balance between all those pieces, uh, what's best to support your community to validate and replicate your research findings. 
If I if I could chime in with with an, another question, Nicholas, thanks. So um, there's a lot of focus on uh, data associated with publications and and uh, being able to replicate findings, which are important things. But the Nelson Memorandum also extends Holdren to uh, pre-publication data, right? Being opening that to some level. And um, there are a lot of questions in there, are several questions in our Google Docs today about how we prevent just having a jumble of, of data and how we describe data. We know as a community that we need uh, more community vetted metadata type of standards and communication on data models so that one can not only programmatically access somebody, somebody else's data, but actually understand what to do appropriately with that data, what can and can't be done. But it seems to me that that's a much more complicated question as we move uh, earlier and earlier in time in sort of the data life cycle to right after collection of data versus once the data is understood by those who collect it and can be uh, cleaned up and organized. Is that sort of thinking about that whole spectrum of data really on the table in agencies today and producing these types of implementation plans? Or is there still mostly a focus on things that will make it to publication? Oh, well, I'll note we don't have a new plan that's out to speak to. Um, it, right. It's only due to OMB and OSTP today. Uh, but I believe the memo asks for a timeline um, and a process for sharing data not underlying a publication, uh, but without being specific on what that timeline is. Uh, so once again, as you point out, having some community consensus or a community standard is probably the way to make sure that any data produced in that situation becomes most useful more broadly to the community. Uh, but that is a new element of the memo, so it's not something very directly addressed in our previous public access plan. Um, and I think there are certainly some interesting questions that we would turn to the community for a better standing, understanding of uh, as we uh, help realize, well, what's it mean to share that data in a useful manner? Um, in the end, the aim is, uh, I think the vision is make the data more useful by making it open. Uh, so sharing things in a format that's not helping others in the community because it's not conforming to a standard is probably not in line with that vision. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Keeping an eye on that vision is critical. Open just to say you're open is not much use. So. 